Locate in your Bibles this morning the New Testament letter of Paul to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Does it make sense? To Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Chapter 16. And in just a moment, I'm going to read from verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. A very simple verse, very straightforward, one not only worthy of memorization, but one which is easy to memorize. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Could we say that together? It's short enough. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. And once again, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Now look away from your Bibles for a moment. Be what? Stand firm where? Act like what? What's the final one? Be strong. <laughs> be strong. There we go. Okay, so be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. As we've traveled through 1 Corinthians since the autumn of 2018, we have learned many lessons that are uh, relevant to us today as much as they were relevant to the church that received this letter. Paul writes to a gathering of believers in Jesus Christ. They are people who have professed publicly their repentance of sin and faith in Jesus. And they've made that profession publicly in the waters of baptism as they have told of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, their unity with the crucified, buried, and risen Christ, and their future hope of resurrection in Christ. But over time, they've drifted somewhat from both that message and its implications for their lives as individuals, and also their life as a local church. What should be the ideal of a church, is a healthy church, is actually, in the Corinthian context, an unhealthy church. But that does not make them any less worth addressing as Christ's people. That does not make them any less worth fighting for and striving for as people of the risen King. The Apostle Paul does not say, well, I think you've misbehaved quite enough, so I'm going to distance myself from you. He does not say, well, I, I, I really think that your lack of discipline in these areas means I should uh, just no longer regard you as a church and no longer regard many of you, perhaps most of you, could be all of you as Christians. Rather, he writes to them as babes in Christ. He writes to them as spiritual infants who have a genuine and sincere faith in Jesus Christ, but in whom the work of transformation and progressive reformation has not yet been fully accomplished. Indeed, he writes as one who knows this in himself and of himself, that he has his own areas of weakness and foolishness, but he is appealing to a higher weakness, a higher foolishness. The crucified Jesus Christ and the good news that Christ came to save sinners and it is his weakness and his foolishness which is actually stronger than the weakness and foolishness of men and which is our hope for life and eternity. 
So he's writing about that. And as he concludes this letter, he begins to to bring together a few thoughts. And I want you to get away from any notion that these things are not um, connected, that this is just a few things sort of last minute. He's chucked in at the end as he winds down this letter. Maybe he doesn't know exactly how to sign out. Uh, and, and so the conclusion is a bit sporadic. Um, and all of this is built on the foundation of the preceding 16 chapters. First of all, be watchful. He says um, to, to, to be watchful, that is about being alert, having your eyes open. And not just open, because there are plenty of people whose eyes are open and, and, and they're kind of glazed over. You've seen that before, haven't you? Uh, you've been that person before. I've had to see it before in your eyes before. Hopefully not today, but every now and then uh, the week catches up to you on a Sunday morning, right? And, uh, and, and you just sort of, you know, go blank. I know there are times when um, Uliana asks me um, uh, 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 if I'm all right and says I look like I'm deep in thought. And uh, the honest answer uh, and ladies, this is important for, for guys. Sometimes we look deep in thought. We look like we're in another world. Our eyes are set and looking in the distance. Our mind is quite literally blank at that moment. We are not thinking about anything. We're just taking a, a break. We're resting. And, uh, and so um, all of us have those moments where we know our eyes are open, but we're not al- alert. So perhaps it's not enough to say, open your eyes. Perhaps you have to say, look around and be focusing your eyes and be, be like the watchman on the walls of a city in the, in, in the times in which Paul wrote, who's, who's looking out at, at, for, for any signs of, of danger, for anyone that, for whom he might have to open the gate, for signs of an invading army or something. You know, have your eyes open and be Watchful, be alert. That 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 means that there's more than just stuff with the eyes going on, but all of your yourself holistically is in tune with your eyes. Being alert is is not just about having your eyes open, but having good sort of hand eye coordination. And so so you, you, you see something happening and you respond good reflexes. You see something that's developing, you react and they teach you that in various ways, um, uh, you know, different things that you might be um, involved in. It could be sports. You have to see something and respond quickly. And you have to discipline yourself to respond quickly to what's happening on the pitch or the field. Um, they, they teach you that when you're learning how to drive. Some of you have already done that. Some of you did it a long time ago. Some of you are just now doing that or have that yet ahead of you. And they have this thing called hazards that they tell you about. And, and you're supposed to watch the video and you're supposed to click, but you can't get any, any you know, smart ideas about just clicking away during the test. Because then they're like, oh, you're cheating. You have to see the hazard and you have to every hazard you see click. So when it comes to your spiritual life, being watchful is being alert. At a minimum to the hazards that your spirituality brings. Being alert to the problems that you may face. As a follower of Jesus. Throughout the the letter here, we've looked at a few different things. We had a section where where we see the letter is something of a performance review. There's been a report that's come back to um, the the Apostle Paul about the church, and they're not doing so well. And uh, you have to be watchful to how you're performing at work. They'll, They'll tell you to examine yourself, to assess yourself, to identify um, you know, objectives and aims and outcomes and all of that stuff is very important as a Christian as well. So when he writes to them about division, they've divided around personalities. They've divided over personality. So there's a clash between different types of person in the church. Uh, they've divided over cultural differences. You have to be alert to that. 
They've, uh, on, on one hand, some have built this, this very high view of, of, of certain leaders, very specific leaders. This leader is worth following, that leader's not. Leaders in the church, leaders out of the church. And it's become an idolatry. And for others, they're neglectful of their leaders. So you have to be alert. How are you regarding leadership? Or are you disregarding leadership? Not only alert to the the problems of division, but alert to the possibilities of discipline. In the Corinthian context, there were situations that called for church discipline at individual, small group, and congregational levels. You have to to be alert. You have to be watchful to identify such situations and to act appropriately. That requires vigilance. You have to see what's happening in your brother or sister's life. You have to be alert to, to, to signs that things are not well. Some of you, I've, I've, I've asked before, um, um, uh, sort of presuming something is wrong. How are you? Because it's written on your face. Because your body language is different. Because uh, the, your, 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 your demeanor is different. Your manners are different. Just the, the whole way I'm perceiving you at that moment is different. And I can tell when you're stressed. I can tell when you're sad. I can tell when there's something that's, that's, that's catching up to you in some way. Now, I'm not all-knowing. I don't know what's happening. And, and, and the only way I can find out and the only way I can help you is if when I ask, how are you, you realize I'm not just being polite, but I'm actually trying to look after you and care for you. And you respond to that not with a I'm well, thanks, but with a, an honest answer of how you're doing. That, that, that's, you know, alertness. Being, being watchful is me seeing there's a problem, but attached to that, there is the need that, that not, I not only respond to the problem, but that you are alert and watchful and respond to my response to the problem. Does that make sense? Then there's a, another section really where he's answering uh, questions. And, and they're not really questions so much as statements that some people have made about um, uh, you know, the Christian life and how they're supposed to conduct themselves. There's areas related to sex and singleness and marriage. What you can do versus what you should or should not do. Uh, How to consider or not consider weaker brothers. How to become a stronger brother. How to deal with idolatrous beliefs, philosophies, behaviors, and life in a world tainted by false gods and pervasive sin. If you're going to grapple with these issues, if you're even going to see that they are issues, you need to be watchful. Then there's that final section of this letter, which really is an exploration of family traditions. Those things that we we practice and teach in the life of the church that are for our good and God's glory and the blessing of our neighbors. What about our worship? Is there appropriate practice of of God's established gender roles in the leadership of the church and in the membership of the church? Is there distinctive exercise of both authority and mutuality between the men and the women in the church? Is there is uh, when, when we take the Lord's Supper, are we doing so communally and congregationally? Truly together in union with our brothers and sisters as a church, or are we just making a show of it? Is it just pretentious? Uh, Are are we doing so carefully, examining ourselves to see if there's any unrepented sin or any division that we need to to heal? Are, Are we doing so Christologically as repentant sinners saved by grace through faith in Christ alone? And this is not my supper. This is the Lord's supper. Are you using your spiritual gifts to build up the church and glorify God in meeting your neighbor's needs? 
What are areas that you've identified in church life where your service is needed? That's not for the pastor or the elders or the deacons to identify that. It's not for them to to try and drag you into the gap. It's for you to see a gap and you to identify your gifts and for you to step up and fill that gap. What, what, what are ways you are being proactive and taking initiative to actually serve? And to do so, I know sometimes we, not, not just with the best of intentions, but making a hash of things, and that's going to happen because we're humans, but, but striving to do so with enthusiasm and excellence. There, let, let, let's not fall into to patterns where, where we, we, we feel like we can just go about our, our life ticking various boxes and that be good enough. Uh, starting something but not finishing it. Being given something to do or asked to do something and doing it shoddily and the person has to not only go and do it themselves but have to clean up the additional mess that you've made. That, that, all, all of that is stuff that you, you have to examine yourself to see. Am I being excellent in the church? Am I being enthusiastic in my service? Am I serving God with everything that I have, not for myself, but for Him and for the good of my neighbor? What, what, what about worship? Is, is it, is it um, filled with shouts of praise and cries of prayer that can be understood or uh, if, if not, can be at least interpreted so that everyone is built up? And chiefly, fundamentally, are we preaching the Word of God, the whole counsel, the law, the gospel, the implications of the gospel, faith and faithfulness? Are we pursuing holiness and obedience? Do we proclaim Jesus crucified for sinners, literally resurrected from the dead, ascended, returning to resurrect and judge the world in righteousness? And are we listening? And are we observing ways in which we as a church might be drifting or in which we as individuals might be drifting into non-God glorifying waters? You have to be watchful. What are areas in your own life that you need to get under control? What are areas in your life where you need to be more disciplined? A church is only as good as its members. If, if you are indisciplined and if you lack control and if you are not stepping out in faith with power and with love of the Holy Spirit, then... You, you, you can't really look around and see a lot of other people who are doing the same thing and have a problem with that because you're the same way. That said, you have to consider that there may be some brothers and sisters who are exhausted because they've been doing that and they need you to come alongside and link arms with them to keep them in the fight. They don't, they, they don't need um, uh, to, to feel like uh, that, that they're being hindered and held back from service. They need to, to feel equipped and enabled by your very presence alongside them. You must be watchful. Watchfulness has such a, a wide range of, of applications. I hope that even as I'm speaking, you're thinking of ways perhaps in which you've let your guard down. Perhaps you've been slacking. Perhaps there are things you've been asked to do you've not done. Things you've been told to do even through the preaching or even personal um, uh, pastoral advice or just the, the, the gentle words of a brother or sister coming alongside and telling you something in your ear that will be a benefit and blessing to you. And, and you're not acting on that. I'm, I'm, I'm challenging you to do so this morning. To, 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 to hear this as the words of someone who loves you and cares for each and every one of you, and yet you thought, I, 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 I was talking about myself, that is true, but God loves you and cares for you, and He wants you to be actively a part of His family. To be committed to a life of service. 
even sacrificially for His glory. I have to, to move on. But I'm saying open your eyes. Keep your eyes open. Look around and, 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 and zone in on all of the stuff that you need to be focused on so, so, so that you're ready with spiritual reflexes to re, not, not react because a reaction can be unhelpful, but to respond to the situations that come your way. Be watchful. But not only be watchful, he says, what's the second thing? Stand firm. firm. When you consider the things I've just mentioned, um, when you're alert and and watchful, I hope that you have some sense of, of awareness of the overwhelming power of the enemy. Not just the overwhelming power of the enemy, but the enormous potential of your friends that can only be realized as as your participant with them in the body of Christ. But, But on the one hand, you have enormous potential that perhaps is being unrealized and untapped and people are going unequipped or ill-equipped or, or they're not being stirred up by, by you know, just maybe a handful of people, but they need fresh voices. They need new people in their, their, their lives. Or maybe not new people, but old people suddenly speaking up and doing what they need to be doing as followers of Christ. There's, there, there's that. But on the other hand, you, and that's challenging enough, on the other hand, you have the enormous power of the enemy who could sweep you away. Have you ever been to a, a, a beach where you know, the waves are just really, really crashing? Uh, personally, I, I like that. I like the sound. I like going into the waves. I like sort of, um, I play a bit of a game. When uh, Uliana and I went to um, Bulgaria, I went into the Black Sea, and there's the, the, the waves crashing. They, they were crashing, but in the grand scheme of waves, they were probably pretty tame. You know, it's not the sort of freak wave that comes out of nowhere and has been known to, you know, break someone's bones or even kill them. It's not that kind of thing. It's just a, you know, nice, rolling, steady, sizable wave. But it's strong, even when the sea is relatively calm. And I like to, I liked each time we went down to sort of try and root my, my, my feet in the sand as much as possible and, and see how, how much I could sort of stand against the waves. And every time I eventually fell, every time I, I eventually gave way, I thought, okay, well, maybe, maybe I will just sit. I'll, I'll, I'll get a bit closer to the shore and I'll, I'll just sit and I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of plow my, my knees into the sand and, um, uh, you know, sort of, sort of like that, just planted in the sand. And, um, you know, the sea makes you do acrobatics that you, you weren't really otherwise capable of. And so I'm flipping about and flailing about in the sea because of fairly mediocre waves. You know, life uh, is much stronger than that, much uh, more dangerous than that. And the, the way it is manipulated by our adversary, by the devil and his uh, servants, is well and truly dangerous. It's not playing a game with the waves of, of the sea on holiday. It's spiritual warfare. And you and I must stand firm. But the importance here is not the what, standing, nor is it the how, firm, nor is it even the contextual why, the many things that might overcome us and assault us. Rather, while those things are vitally important, it is the where of your standing that matters the most. He does not simply say stand firm. He says stand firm in the faith. It doesn't matter. You'll stand anyway. 
somewhere. You'll choose ground on which to stand and you'll stand. That doesn't mean you'll stay standing, but you'll find your place to stand and you'll make a go of it for a while, but eventually you'll fall. Eventually you'll fail in life or in eternity. But you'll choose a place to stand. And you may even stand firm for a time, but it will be in a wrong, stubborn-headed course that rebels against God. If you're standing firm in the wrong soil, you will be swept away. Now, perhaps even in eternity. God's God's word says something and and, and your response is to say, "I, I know God's word says this, but I think. Some Corinthians would have said, I think Paul is better than Apollos, or I think Apollos is better than Cephas, or I think uh, I think Cephas wasn't a nice guy. He just passed through briefly. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we had him instead of Paul and Apollos and the the local elders here in the church? I, I think and they're neglecting Jesus Christ. And they're falling into unhelpful, divisive patterns. Some would have said, I think. I will sue my brother instead of trying to resolve things with him out of court at a more appropriate level with the adjudication and mediation of the leadership of the church. Some said, I think that, that, that I, I will choose this particular course in my life even though it deviates from God's design and the norms that He's... he's It's not just the norms, but the eternal principles even, the creation principles that He's instituted. I think I'll go that way. But you'll find that thinking not submitted to the authority of the Creator is futile. And it will enslave you to ideas, philosophies, and idolatries that will utterly destroy you. God's Word says something. But you choose to dig in your heels and you say, it's just that I feel... How many times have 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 you heard that? How many times have you been that person? It's just that I feel. Do you think that the 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 man in Corinth sleeping around with his stepmom um, had feelings? Let's just be real because that's what that's that's we're we're, we're told that in London at least that that's what I was. Told by the mayor paid for posters on the tube that that love is free and open in London. London is open for love and you can love whoever you choose. You can love whoever you 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 please. But, you know, I I have people who have told me. I I, I can love whoever I please. I I thought I could love whoever I please. And, And so I had a relationship with an underage teenager. I've heard that. People have used the, the love as you please thing to my ears. I'm not just giving you some sort of slippery slope argument. People have actually said that. I can love as I please. Do you think the, the people who have a wife here and then a wife in another country that we've sometimes heard or known or talked about, it, uh, they don't have feelings? They like the woman here, they like the woman there. What's stopping them? The man who, who was there with, with, with his, his step, stepmom might have said, I, I feel like having an intimate relationship with her. Other people would have said, I feel like having sex outside of marriage. I feel like marrying someone who has fundamentally different beliefs From me, I feel like dumping my husband or my wife for reasons other than unfaithfulness and abandonment. You think those people who were eating at the church meal, not being considerate of others around them, gorging while others went hungry, didn't feel hungry? They felt hungry. And so they ate and they drank. People felt like going places. They felt like doing things that might needlessly offend their brother of weaker disposition. 
And of course, if you if you buy the mantra that's out there at the moment, it has been in some form for centuries. Don't think it's a new thing. Uh, it's there in the days of Paul in Corinth. It's it's a it's a world thing. Eve saw the fruit and felt like eating it, and we've been feeling stuff ever since. And so. When you have feelings, don't get me wrong, feel, some people are like, oh, think, think, don't feel. Other people are like, feel, don't think. I say, our thoughts were created by God. Think. Our feelings were given to us by God. Feel. But think and feel in submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ under the authority of God's Word. Because feelings that are not shaped and secured by eternal transcendent principles are fickle and fleeting, and they will selfishly harm others, carrying you away into great danger. God's Word says something, and and, and you take His stand and you say, I know it says that, but I'm still going to do this. At Corinth, they knew... That everything was to be done in love for the upbuilding of their brothers and sisters in the church. That was not new to them, but it didn't stop them from doing their own thing in their own way. When you are doing things not under the authority of the Lord, you don't glorify God. You don't do good to your neighbor. You don't glorify God in the good of your neighbor. And the church is not upbuilt. But when you stand firm in the faith, not standing firm in anchorless thoughts and feelings and actions, not standing firm in some sort of self-reliant use of your head, your heart, and your hands, but you stand firm in the faith. You have something that the world says is foolish and weak, but it is God's wisdom and power. When you stand firm in the faith, wrong thoughts, feelings, and works may come your way. Do not misunderstand me. Standing firm in the faith is still in the face of the waves of life. It's still in the face of the assault of the enemy. It's still in the face of everything that would do you in and do you harm. But you're held and you're helped when you stand firm in the faith. When you stand firm in the faith, your feet aren't floating in the stormy seas of your storm-tossed tossed. Thoughts. When, when, when you are firm in the faith, you, you, your feet are not standing on the shifting sands of your emotion bound feelings. Your feet are not pacing all over the path, all over the place on the paths that that you choose doing things your way. You're standing firm in the faith. And you're able to say, my feet are on a rock. My feet are on solid ground. My feet are not in Myself, but they're in my faith. And my faith is in my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And even though the waves may not be pleasant or easy to weather or what I would prefer, I will stand in something that actually saves me. Something that actually holds me and helps me, that gives me a home eternally. Not something that is a halfway house for hell. And finally, he says, act like men, be strong. And you say, that's weird. Why is he combined the two? He he gave us in neat bite-sized portions and, and that's how it's written, but he's act like men and be strong. It's like he's rushing this. I, I actually, it's because the Greek version of, uh, uh, what we see here act like men is the Greek version of a Hebrew saying in the Old Testament that actually combines the two. You, you don't have the be strong without the act like men, but it's worded differently in the Hebrew language. After the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament was written, a group of Greek speaking Hebrew scholars translated it 
for the use of Greek-speaking Jews. And when they translated the words, be of courage, they thought, what is a contextual way to express courage in our Greek-speaking context? The, the word that we know as courage, their Hebrew word. And they said, andridzomai. Andridzomai means act like men. It's the ancient equivalent of man up. At Paul's time, and one could wish that it were still that way, I suppose, there was a higher expectation of men, that there was a way they were to act and a way they were not to act in time of crisis. Men were expected to be mature, to be strong, to take the lead, to take initiative, to kill the poison of passivity, and to be proactive, protective, providers, men who loved peace, but were prepared to go to war to protect and preserve it. When they weren't doing these things, they were told, man up, act like men. We face a crisis of masculinity, I believe, in our society at the moment where you have to, once again, tell men to act like men. Now, Paul's telling everyone act like men. I'll get to that in a moment. But, but you have to actually tell the men, because it's, the women are often doing a better job of acting like men than the men are. Plenty of men know how to play soldiers, but not how to be soldiers. They are heroes on virtual battlefields. I'm not dissing video games. If that's your hobby, cool for you. That's fine. Enjoy it in moderation with self-control and in good Christian conscience. But there are people who are heroes on virtual battle, the virtual battlefields of their Xboxes and their PS4s who aren't heroes in life and never will be if they keep living like they are. Men who want to be treated like kings. And in fact, would go so far as to, at least online, uh, talk about that. About how you know they, find, find, they want to find a woman who will treat them like a king, but they're not ready to be a king. Men who fancy themselves warriors, but they turn wimpish when their strength and their skills are most needed. And of course, there are two extremes in today's crises of masculinity. You have wicked brutes on one hand, and you have weak boys on the other. Neither are being the men that God calls them to be. And I'm speaking not to men outside this room this morning. I'm speaking to those who are here today. Not even for you necessarily to pass this on to other men. You, of all people, are called to man up because you are intrinsically men. At one level, you should not be called to man up. You shouldn't have to be told to man up. You should just be that. Don't deflect to the perceived inadequacies of the women in your life or society. Don't be distracted by what you see as a void because maybe there are no women in your life. And, and you feel like to be a man, you have to have a woman in your life. And that's, that's not true. Paul was more a man than any of us will ever be. And he was single and very transparent about it. Man up and be who you are called to be, whether you're married, whether you're single, wherever you are, act like men. You know, with few exceptions, men were leaders of the old covenant people of God. They were the tribal tribal chiefs. They were the priests, the prophets, the kings, the soldiers, the choir masters. The composers, the songwriters, the the poets, the wise men, and, 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 and so forth. 
Some of you are like choir masters. Oh, that's a girl's job. No, you've adopted some sort of uh, sort of toxic definition of masculinity that, that 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 says it's not manly to sing. It's not manly to make music. That's a lie. Don't believe it. Men knew how to fight and they knew how to sing. And some like David knew how to do both. At the inauguration of the new covenant, the disciples Jesus chose and spent most of the time with um, in anticipation of their future church leadership were men. Twelve men he identified and equipped. When one of them betrayed Jesus uh, and, and was out of the picture, they appointed another man to take his place. And then there's another one who's later appointed as one untimely born, the Apostle Paul. Men are called to the spiritual, practical, and functional heads of their households. Men are called to the pastoral oversight and leadership of the church. Men are to sacrificially love their wives, to train and discipline their children, and their wives are to respect and obey them. But it's difficult for them to do that, and they'll often say this because they don't see something to respect. And the men don't give them strong, decisive leadership to obey. Men are to strive for excellence in every aspect of their life. They are to be an example to people in the congregation that men and women alike can look at and emulate and respect and strive to reflect. Men are to invest in other men, teaching them about life and godliness in general. More specifically, they're to identify and equip other men with the Word of God so that those men will teach others also. Thus, the church is added to and multiplies. Why is it that people ask that there are often more women in church than men? Because sometimes the women do a better job acting like men. And they fill the gaps that the men haven't filled, that they were appointed to fill. But when they weren't doing it, The women looked around and said it has to be done, and they did it. The problem is not the women, the problem is the men. People ask why even when I'm talking, dealing with passages about women, I'll I'll segue, Charles Charles is like, oh, yeah, 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 go on. When you're talking about women, you segue into some critique of men. Because women are reflecting the men. If you have a problem with your wife, the problem might be something that she's just reflecting. And she's become what she resents. And she's become what she, 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 or maybe she's become what she desires, what she craves for in you, but is absent. And so she's either being a reflection of you at your worst or a rejection of you in your worst. And so you have to act like men. And now is the time, because I'm talking to guys who are mainly single um, uh, this morning, most, most of you, but there are a good few of you who are married too. Now is the time, single brothers, for you to step up now so we don't have to be having difficult lessons learned later on. The thing is, once you man up, then the women can look and see in you someone to reflect. And they can better identify the ways in which they, as women, need to man up. Ultimately, we we see that this is for everyone. It's just an expression. Act like men. He's talking to a church. And a church is made up of men and women equal in Jesus Christ before God. How can a woman man up? Well, Proverbs 31, 25 says, Strength and dignity are her clothing. And she laughs at the time to come. Women, be that kind of woman. Who, who, who says, I, 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 I know who holds the future. My life is in His hands. Not someone who's crippled with anxiety. Not someone like I shared recently. I had all these text messages from people vexed and stressed by, uh, by uh, you know, the, the present political climate. And you would have thought Armageddon had kicked off. And uh, just someone was like, oh, it's, really ha- it's really affected my mental health and I just, I don't see a future and I've never been more ashamed of my national identity. I've never, oh, oh, you know, fair play. Everyone in this church is welcome to have their own political views. I'm not talking about that. But the collective meltdown was out of control. 
Be, don't be hand-wringing women. And men, if, if you see a woman who, whose hands are wringing, reach out and take them. And be there to be strong. And to show them, be strong. But you can't do that unless you men up. Women, be like Mary, who when she was told she would carry the Christ in her womb, though a virgin, with all of the potential social repercussions that would have, she said, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Be daughters of Sarah, who in the words of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 6, do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. I hope you heard that. There's a bit of noise from the back. Women who man up are women who do not fear things that are legitimately frightening. I know it's scary out there. I know there are things to be afraid of. But don't be afraid. Don't be scared. It will be okay. As I said a moment ago, this is the Greek way of continuing the Old Testament command to be strong and courageous. And, 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 and so um, I, I add, be strong. The strength you have and I, I have access to is not just any strength. It comes from the Lord. It's in the depths of your spirit. Ours is a spirit, not of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. It's Isaiah preaching with a face like flint, like stone to people who won't hear him and hate his, him. It's that kind of strength. It's the kind of strength that Jesus had, who it says he set his face resolutely for Jerusalem when he knew he was going there for the last time, this time for death and glory. It is resurrection from the grave kind of strength. It's Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost kind of strength. It's Stephen preaching and praying to the death strength. It's Paul and Silas beaten to a messy pulp on their backs, thrown into prison and singing hymns of praise kind of strength. Be strong. I feel like now our, our obstacles are so vastly different. We don't have people throwing us into prisons after 39 lashes in this country. We have brothers who are enduring the same and worse in other parts of the world. Some whom we have in our own church who have fled here from those, those, those situations. But in this country, we have a measure of freedom. And yet, we have this, this crippling anxiety. This emotional, mental, psychological persecution. And I'm telling you, get out of yourself and your own emotional fragility. Be strong and courageous. Moses had been to the mountaintop. He'd seen the promised land. He couldn't go there with the people he had long led. And God speaking to him, and Moses then speaking to his people, says to the people, Be strong and courageous. Be strong and act like men. I might not be with you, but the Lord will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Moses dies and the Lord appoints Joshua. The Lord said to him, be strong and courageous. Be strong and act like a man. You will bring Israel into the promised land and I will be with you. Joshua repeatedly said to the people of Israel as he rallied their great host into Canaan, be strong and courageous, be strong and act like men, for the Lord our God is with us. David sang it in Psalm 27. We began our service with that wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Be strong and act like men. He'd say it again when he passed the reins of kingship to Solomon, his son, and with it a command to build a temple for the Lord. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and act like a man. 
and do it. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. Why? For the Lord, even my God, is with you. And down through the ages, that encouragement rings. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and act like a man because the Lord is with us. We get to these words from Paul. We then leap to the year 160 AD where the last surviving man to have known an apostle, his name is Polycarp. He's an old man. He's arrested and he's dragged to the arena. And as they bring him into the arena, the proconsul in front of baying masses of people out for Christian blood says, Reproach Christ, and I will set you free. And the brothers who were watching this with Polycarp, they'd not been arrested, but they said a, they heard a voice from heaven to this old 80, 90 something year old man. Be strong and play the man, for I am with you. And Polycarp answered the proconsul and said, 86 years I have served Christ, and he's done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? The proconsul says, I have wild animals here. And he brings the wild animals out and they're growling and gnashing and foaming at the the mouth. And this 90 year old guy is standing there and, and he says, call them. It's unthinkable for me to repent from what is good to turn to what is evil. I will be glad to be changed from evil to righteousness. The proconsul realizes he's losing. He, he's actually not in control here. Polycarp has heard the voice of the Lord. I'm with you. Be strong and play the man. And so the proconsul says, well, if you're not afraid of the animals, I'll burn you. I'll burn you alive, old man. And Polycarp says, you threaten me with fire, which burns just for an hour and is then extinguished. But you know nothing of the fire of the coming judgment and eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. Why are you waiting? Bring on whatever you want. And they burned that old man to death. And he was fine. Because God was with him. You leap many centuries to October 1555 in this very country. A couple of men were brought for trial under the reign of Queen Mary. Bloody Mary, they call her. For for preaching contrary to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. Hugh Latimer, Nicholas Ridley. Nicholas Ridley, a young scholar, is brought up and he's asked if he believes that the Pope is the heir to the authority of Peter. That he exercises apostolic authority. And, and, and he said, no, the, the church is built not on any man, but on the truth. Peter confessed that Christ is the son of God. They were, he was asked if he could honor the pope in Rome. And, and he said, no, I can't because the papacy is seeking its own glory, not the glory of God. Ridley and Latimer were, were, were both urged to accept that the Roman Catholic Mass is, a, is effectively, the, the, is not effectively, it is literally the body and blood of Jesus. That this is actually by the prayer of a priest, real flesh and real blood, and that thereby Jesus is re-sacrificed for our sins. And Latimer told them, Christ made one oblation and sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. And that was a perfect sacrifice. And there need be no other, nor can there be any other wrath appeasing, propitiatory sacrifice. And so they took them to the stake. And they tied them up and they stacked wood around their legs and their bodies. As he was being led to the stake, Ridley said, O Heavenly Father, I give unto thee most hearty thanks that you have called me to be a professor of you, even unto death. And I beseech thee, O Lord God, have mercy on this realm of England and deliver it from all her enemies. His brother had brought some gunpowder. His brother's trying to help, okay? 
I'm going to tie the gunpowder around your neck. And that way the flames, when it tastes the gunpowder, will blow up and take your life more quickly. But he still suffered greatly. You see, the wood that was built around him was green. And it wasn't burning properly. And so he said as the flame started at his feet, into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. But because the wood was green and slow burning, it was only burning his legs. And, and, and it wasn't reaching his utter body. And so what, it was only torturing him. It wasn't killing him. And so he repeatedly cried out, Lord God, have mercy Have mercy on me. I cannot burn. Let the fire come to me. I cannot burn. Latimer, the wood was drier and the flames are licking up his clothes to his chest. And he cried out to Ridley. Be of good comfort, Master Ridley. Be of good courage. Be strong. And play the man. For we shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. We stand on the shoulders of these giants. Or do we? Perhaps they're not giants at all. Perhaps they're just men. Who knew how to be watchful, how to stand firm in the faith, how to be strong, how to act like men. I know our nation has changed, but God's word has not. Our battles and sufferings may be different, but the apostolic command is not. Let's hear and heed the word of the Lord. Amen.